the themes that we saw emerging in the first report were first that mining companies were ignoring the real threats of the pandemic and continuing to operate, really doing whatever they can, whatever they could to continue to operate. And you know, again, as I as I mentioned, putting communities and mine workers at risk of infection, and there were a number of outbreaks and and deaths as a result of this of this approach. Um, including, uh, I think, especially tragically, um, Indigenous elders in a number of communities that, that need not have been put at risk and were instead lost. We saw that governments around the world were taking extraordinary measures to shut down legitimate protests and to promote the mining sector. We saw that the mining companies were using the pandemic as an opportunity to hide their track records and present themselves as public minded saviors by providing vaccines by providing test kits by providing food and, and supplies to isolated communities and so on. And we saw that mining companies and governments alike were using the crisis to secure regulatory change or to deregulate to favor the industry at the expense of people and the planet. And so, you know, that report, I think, made a bit of a splash and, and we hope that it, it helped empower communities and it helped change the balance of power somewhat in favor of communities and and I think some of the case studies show uh, communities with with support from uh, international organizations and and in solidarity with each other were able to push back in a number of cases and and change the situation in their own favor um, so the groups that were involved in this report, you know, we wanted to continue to follow up and, and we were able to secure funding and to establish this, this global project to expand the coalition to be more truly global and to continue to expand this work. We, we secured funding from the Response and Vision Fund of something called Forge Funders. That's funders organized for rights in the global economy. And we said that you know, left unchecked, the mining and extractive sectors dominance over economic policy will deepen precisely at a time when it should be curtailed in order to address the multiple crises of climate biodiversity and inequality in the face of the pandemic. And we found that, you know, communities will working to build sustainable futures will suffer increased repression and marginalization in the face of mining interests, while those with limited options such as mine workers or mine affected communities will continue to suffer disproportionately from the pandemic and its economic fallout. So this project was intended to work at the local, national and international levels to support local struggles for healthy and resilient communities and workers and weave together those struggles regionally and globally to challenge the dominance of corporate interests and extractivist economics and to protect space for people to develop and maintain sustainable and equitable economies. Uh, and I have just broken the first rule of this webinar, which is to speak slowly so that the interpreters can keep up. For that, I apologize. And I will use that as the opportunity to remind everyone else to speak slowly and clearly for the sake of the interpreters. I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Andrew Garuhanga. Andrew is a co-founder of Resource Rights Africa and currently serves as its executive director. For over 15 years, Andrew has been part of the civil society movement in Uganda, advocating for the promotion, protection, and respect of human rights. And he has served in various fields and positions. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Social Sciences from Makerere University, and is currently pursuing a postgraduate degree in peace and conflict studies from the same university. He is also a founding member of the Rwenzori Anti-Corruption Coalition, and has undertaken consultancy assignments on extractives, resource-based conflicts, and program impact assessments for a range of organizations. Andrew, please take it away. Perfect, perfect, Jamie. Thanks very much, uh, everyone, uh, wherever you are, wherever you are attending this webinar from. As uh, introduced by my co-host, Jamie, I'm delighted to be here at uh, this important um, 
my engagement when the coalition against the mining pandemic is launching this global report but also to remind you that uh, we shall also be launching uh, an important website where all these materials that uh, Jamie has talked about uh, will be uploaded for everyone to see. Uh, before we dive in into our today's uh, discussion, I would like to remind you a few housekeeping um, announcements. Uh, some of them have already been mentioned by my co-host, but I would like to remind you that um, we are going to be here uh, for close to one and uh, 10 minutes or thereabout. And as such, there will be 15, uh, 45 minutes rather of discussion among speakers, uh, followed by 35 minutes of open discussion uh, with the audience. So you are reminded uh, to post uh, your questions in the Q&A uh, box or in the chat. And then as he already mentioned, there is uh, interpretation in Spanish and French. So you can select the, the language of your choice. And uh, of course, it's important to note that um, this is a public event and as such, we, the organizers, don't guarantee, um, give uh, absolute guarantee to your security. And uh, the list of attendees is not public. And if you'd like to comment anonymously, please, you can change your name on Zoom by clicking on the three dots in the upper right hand corner of your box on Zoom and select edit name. So ladies and gentlemen, um, Welcome to uh, this wonderful uh, launch event today. And our goal here today uh, is uh, to have a conversation. This is a dialogue with uh, all of you within this extended network uh, to talk about some of the findings and reflections from our research process and about the next steps that uh, are going to come ahead. We are publishing regional synthesis uh, uh, of this uh, global uh, report. And of course, the regional reports that uh, have come out of this. And of course, the additional case studies that um, are going to be published on the website that we have talked about. And of course, in this, um, the reports have a number of shared themes and some important differences, as you will notice uh, later on. Some of those shared themes pr present in many of the reports uh, as follows. One, as my co-host noted, there is uh, deepening racist colonial and sexist power asymmetries and inequalities. But also another uh, broad issue that we highlight uh, in these studies is that land defenders are facing serious threats in different localities, including militarization, criminalization, and the, shrink the shrinking of civic space Another important theme that emerges from the different case studies, um, we realize that mining being positioned as essential and part of the post-pandemic recovery with governments and companies often urging that um, mining is necessary for the green transition. The other issue that cuts across, that comes out from the different um, reports is that land defenders have continued their brave resistance and have modeled what a just recovery from mining and COVID-19 pandemics needs to look like. Now, it's my humble and honor to turn to the regional coordinators who oversaw uh, this research 
project global in its nature with different issues coming up from different regions, but also different similarities, um, such that we can hear from the regional coordinators to start our discussion, our dialogue about these reports. So let me take this opportunity to introduce the panelists who are going to talk to us uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, on the panel, we have the African coordinator, Hibist Kasa. Dr. Hibis Kasa is a feminist grounded in historical materialist traditions in Africa. Hibis has spent 14 years developing an understanding of African political economy from vantage point of within the feminist movement in Ghana and later globally. She was awarded her doctor doctorate in sociology at the University of Johannesburg in 2019. Hibis is passionate about African cosmology and arts and culture as part of the radical thought needed to rethink African sovereignty in the spirit of self-reliance, self-determination, and alternative development pathways. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome me to welcome Dr. Hibis. Next on the line, from the Asian Pacific, we have JB Gangnera. JB is uh, the national coordinator of ATM, which is Alianza Tigil Mina in full. This is a coalition of more than 100 community organizations and their support groups collectively challenging the aggressive promotion of irresponsible and destructive large-scale mining in the Philippines. JB is currently a member, founder, or convener of a number of broad social movements and coalitions working on environmental justice and human rights in the Philippines. JB, you are most welcome. Next on the line is our coordinator in Latin America, Lenny Oliveira Rogers. Lenny Oliveira studied sociology at the Universidad de San Simón in Cochabamba. Since 2000, and 2000, she has been an activist in Bolivian youth organizations in support of social movements, particularly in relation to water, gas, the coco leaf, and natural resources. Since 2005, she has been more involved in autonomous feminist groups and spaces, and recently more from a class and decolonizing um, perspective. Lenny worked at the Democracy Center for, from 2007 to 2020, when they founded Terra Justa, where she holds the position of director. Her works also focuses on relationships and direct communication with social organizations and allies of affected communities, mainly in the southern region of Peru. You are most welcome uh, to this fantastic audience and we'll be hearing uh, from the perspectives uh, from uh, Latin America. Next on the line, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, our coordinator uh, for Europe, and that is Meg Chaton. We'll be hearing from her the perspectives that come in from her side. And then we'll hear from North American coordinator, Aidan Gilchrist Blackwood. And Aidan uh, is a researcher on extractivism, imperialism, and corporate accountability based in Montreal, Quebec. He holds a master's 
degree in political science from McGill University, where his research examined the Canadian government's use of green transition language to promote the mining sector and the relationship between pro mining discourses, Canadian nationalism, and manufacturing consent for imperialism. So ladies and gentlemen, that's, those are our panelists, and um, we are going to hear from them, sharing the different perspectives coming from the different regions as we dive in into our today's dialogue. So to begin this conversation, um, I would like to now turn to my panelists and the uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I would like to begin with all of you for uh, this conversation and hear from my panelists. For example, JB, if people leave this space today only knowing one, one thing uh, from your report, what should they know? If I could begin with you, JB. Sure, Andrew, thank you for that great introduction. Uh, and welcome to all our audience and to my co-panelists. That is such an interesting question. Okay, if there's one takeaway that I would like the audience to have with this event is that we were we got a double whammy during the COVID um, and the case documentation uh, illustrates this. The double whammy is that uh, communities who are already facing serious challenges in resisting extractive projects, mining and uh, gas and other extractive projects, they're already having uh, problems with that resistance and that struggle. Then COVID comes in and then the lockdown just put additional pressures on their health, on their livelihoods, and even their relations. And so you have affected communities who, for the most part, are less powerful and poor and less access to information. Uh, have to face the challenges of a pandemic. But the other whammy really is that the governments, our governments who were supposed to provide the services, the response for us to be able to weather and, and, and overcome the pandemic in a reasonable manner. Our governments used this global crisis to actually give more favor to the mining industry in the name of profit. It's a, it's a bitter reality that uh, was elaborated in many of the case studies. Whether we look in India, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, um, in Australia, and in Papua New Guinea, the countries where the case studies in Asia Pacific were documented. In a spectrum of more than 18 months, which is the period covered by the documentation, not only did the cases confirm the earlier findings of the first report, and so these cases provide further evidences and actual documentation of the original findings. We actually can trace the, you know, I don't know how to describe this, but, but our governments are both callous and bordering on, on bordering on, oh, I'm, I'm at a loss of words, but basically they made the work of the mining industry much easier and they made profiting from mining much easier for the industry. It's a bitter reality, but uh, that was what happened. You had new laws uh, introduced to make mining easier, and you had old laws uh, changed or revised so that communities are already finding it difficult 
to resist and to do the creative actions now are finding it much more difficult to resist mining in their area. So that's oh, that's you. my main takeaway. But just one sentence, Andrew. I, I would like to assure all our audiences and, and of course the other panelists as well will say this in their piece, I think. Despite that bleak reality that many of us faced, the pandemic did not uh, totally take away the spirit of resistance and struggle of communities because we know that the communities are standing up for their rights. Pandemic or not, I think the communities and the support groups knew that we had to be more creative and innovative. And maybe that could be another point of our interesting conversation. Thank you. Perfect, perfect, JB. Thanks very much for giving us that um, perspective from the Asian Pacific. And of course, I realize that you're bringing in quite interesting experiences from the Philippines, your own home country, and thanks very much. But the, this moderator doesn't respect the democracy, so I will not give the, the leverage that I gave JB. Um, you are entitled to two minutes, and within those two minutes, you are supposed to give us uh, that one one issue that you really uh, see as, uh, uh, you know, um, if people are to move away from this space today, uh, knowing at least you should uh, highlight it to us. So if we can uh, proceed and um, uh, we look here from the rest of the panelists without really me highlighting, please you unmute and then tell us within two minutes what is it that people should walk away from here, emerging from your report? Uh, for example, Meg, please, if, if you could uh, unmute yourself and let us know what do we take away uh, from the report that you led the process to compile. Sure. Um, it's definitely hard to just pick one thing from this project because it has raised so many <laughs> important issues. But if I was to pick one theme that definitely came across the whole project would be this whole reframing of mining as something that is <clears throat> essential and beneficial. Um, the pandemic provided so many new opportunities for mining companies and the supportive governments to exploit the situation for their own economic gain. Um, the pandemic measures provided opportunities to limit resistance to their projects and provides governments and the industry uh, with almost a newfound power to silence this opposition. Um, at the same time, the threats of arrests and fines provided a deterrent at a time of hardship, both psychologically and financially. Um, and there are definitely no shortage of examples where this situation has been exploited, which I'm sure will come out later on in the discussion. Um, but coming back to that reframing, of mining, um, any language that was being used before to frame mining industry as beneficial has now been complemented with language um, such as just when we need it most and fundamental to economic recovery. Um, so materials such as copper and lithium are framed as essential for these new green technologies. But what is often left out are the impacts of the mining projects on the environment and the people that live there. Um, they ignore the contradictions of increasing mining as a solution to the climate crisis um, and for economic recovery when in fact it's causing more health and environmental impacts um, and the fact that this is happening during the pandemic and during a health crisis um, is really significant so a key takeaway would be to really highlight these deliberately place words and timing and how this has been extremely strategic in the context of the pandemic um, and economic recovery. So I hope that was within the two, the two minute time limit. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. Very much. Thanks very much, Meg, for giving us um, uh, that perspective from Europe. I would like you again to remind uh, the upcoming uh, panelists that uh, there is translation that is ongoing. So even uh, with my strictness in terms of keeping into time, bear in mind that the translation is ongoing and our colleagues need to absorb uh, all what we are submitting. Thanks very much, Meg. Um, 
to continue with the, our um, uh, experience sharing, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, um, uh, I would like to call now, um, let's hear from the African uh, perspective and the, here we go to Hibist who led or coordinated um, uh, the regional report that uh, was compiled on the African continent. And you know quite a lot, Africa is well endowed with quite a number of minerals and quite a lot happened during the pandemic. Over to you, Hibist. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I just want to make a quicker um, 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 note here that actually this uh, project was coordinated by Boepelo Bonokwane and uh, she led the process right to the very end. And I just came in as a supporting role and she moved uh, currently, she exited Woman and is currently with Thousand Currents. And so um, I'm uh, essentially, uh, my task was to pull together the analysis of Boepelo Bonokwane and we'd work closely on this. And, and I think one of the key things that come out strongly <clears throat> when you're thinking of the African region uh, and in relation to extractives, immediate thought is the extent of the uneven integration in the global economy, the extent to which we're dependent on the export of raw materials and the extent to which the environmental and the historic, his, historically how this is embedded in histories of colonization, but broadly speaking on a global scale uh, in relation to other regions, the level of industrialization or diversification of our economies is quite low compared to others. So therefore you find a scenario where um, just at the outset of the COVID pandemic, uh, the African region was thrown into the first major recession since 1995. And its ability to uh, recover from that uh, recession was uh, largely drawing to uh, uh, private investments, but also the in that context of desperation, African governments turned to the mining companies. And in many ways, startlingly, not just in situations where they were imposing lockdowns as measures to also deal with the public health crisis, but even in a case like Tanzania, where controversially there weren't measures being introduced to deal with the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, even in that context, you have a situation where uh, the mining companies were able to impose restrictions on people's movements and as a way to kind of essentially securitizing the response to the crisis, taking advantage of that, to then be able to uh, be more aggressive with the extractivist processes. The environmental impacts are also documented in Mali, the extent to which the fact that people were unable as a result of curfews to monitor and undertake their own monitoring activities of mining companies. As a result, they were essentially unable to uh, uh, essentially document and prevent and uh, hold to account, have mechanisms to hold to account the mining companies. And you have similar things also in uh, Ivory Coast. Um, with the extent to which, and in Namibia, in the Okavango, uh, uh, the Okavango Basin, you have a situation where oil and gas in itself also became strategic for the government. A high, a country where, where in relation to the rest of the continent, the incidence of COVID was not as high. And there are many reasons and uh, interpretations that have been made for that. But part of it has to do with just uh, in the situation where you have a situation where in Namibia, you have uh, high rates of COVID uh, infections as was the case similarly in South Africa, but you have a situation where the governments were so desperate uh, that they were willing to uh, per give permits, environmental uh, permits to uh, Reconnaissance Africa to be able to uh, do its surveying, seismic surveys, but in a context where the community did not have any free, there was no free prior informed consent. Uh, and you also have a situation where people are being dispossessed from their ancestral lands. Uh, so this, it, in its way was kind of intensifying the kind of primitive accumulation that we're all very much in, uh, familiar with uh, on the continent and in the context of uh, drought. So you have a situation where in Uganda, for instance, prior to the COVID pandemic, they were already dealing with droughts. Um, so the extractivism and all its contradictions became deepened during the COVID uh, pandemic. It was, uh, if you will, a very uh, toxic scenario where the, it's created opportunities to kind of dispense with normal uh, processes, hard won, uh, if you will, practices. And even in context where people were struggling to even implement the, 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 the policies that already exist, they were able to suspend them. Uh, and uh, that for me was, 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 was a dangerous scenario. But as JB eloquently said at the end, people also had their own responses 
through the through the through the crisis, thinking about forming cooperatives. Importantly, in Namibia, in the Okavango Basin, people are thinking about an indigenous knowledge economy. So uh, there are ways in which people are trying to reimagine and reestablish their livelihoods and control in a context where there had been retrenchments and dispossession and uh, people being essentially livelihoods disrupted, especially artisanal miners. They suffered a lot. Uh, and we found that repeatedly throughout the report um, and throughout the case studies. Um, so in that sense, uh, it, it, was, it was extreme conditions that deepened the contradictions of extractivism, uh, but our people uh, on the ground were not um, uh, passive and have been thinking of ways to also strengthen their engagements and form solidarities. And through this, we've been able to capture part of that. Thank you. Perfect, perfect, TBST, for that uh, elaborate um, submission. Indeed, uh, what comes out is that mining was considered essential in many of the African uh, 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 countries, and that meant, you know, they, they never minded about uh, the spread of COVID. Come what may, mining had to go on. Thanks very much, Hibis. I know we shall dive into the deeper end of the discussion around these issues, important issues that you highlight. But for now, uh, thanks very much. So let's go on to our colleague, um, Lenny, uh, who is joining us from uh, Latin America and sharing with us the context within that um, uh, region. Lenny, you are most welcome and you have two minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, so, um, uh, of course, there are common aspects that our reports are reflecting here in Hevist, JV, and NEC. And I would like just to point something uh, specifically more from Latin America. And yeah, uh, it's important to know that uh, in the context of Latin America, uh, many defenders um, were already losing their lives to the mining pandemic before the pandemic of COVID-19, right? So several countries, countries in Latin America are among the most dangerous in the world for mining, for defenders uh, of territories, water and, and the environment. So for, for, for us, uh, one important aspect that we can identify uh, among all the aspects that is difficult to to, to, to be sure about that, but one aspect that it's very important is that resistance and the struggles of the communities, which in different ways continue, were, were continued as, as my colleagues mentioned, the, the, the communities, uh, although they have many disadvantages were struggling, um, some of them with greater difficulties than others, but what would happen is that all these resistance and struggles in this more complex and with more difficulties and more crisis um, showed us that it's really what is really essential is not mining activity, um, it's specifically framed in within this capitalist capitalist destructive model. So uh, what, what is really essential is the defense of territory, water, and a healthy environment. So the, the experiences of the com communities affected by mining during the period should make us reflect on this destructive economic model, which does not care about life and health of the people and continues reproducing historical and colonial power dynamics, which are it's uh, that 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 brings racist discriminate discrimination and in exploitation. So that's why for us it's been, been important that based on this important aspect, uh, before it is too late, uh, we need to question the capitalist extractive model that turns entire territories and into militarized sac sacrifice zones and subordinates indigenous, indigenous communities and um, denies other visions of, of ways of being um, that allow us to live better and in not aggressive ways with the nature and, and between people. And well, I think this last reflection is based on this, um, on this aspect that, that um, 
I would like to spotlight more in our report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lenny, for giving us uh, the Latin American experience. And I think I also I thank you for keeping within the time. Um, and as such, ladies and gentlemen, let me now um, turn to Aiden, uh, who has been really at the helm of uh, uh, putting together the North American um, uh, report, but also looking at the broader picture and mobilizing us. So Aiden, uh, please unmute and share with us uh, your thoughts on what emerges that one thing that you'd like uh, uh, participants here to hear. Over to you. Thank you so much, Andrew. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Andrew. And thank you to everyone who um, for, for your comments already. I, I think like Lenny was saying in, in her comments, I'll probably there, are, I think there's a lot of commonalities and a lot of things that I'll, I could echo from, from things that folks have highlighted here. Um, and maybe one thing that I'll, I'll, I'll center in on from the North American context that I think is really important um, it is the ways that the COVID-19 pandemic um, has, has really exacerbated racist settler colonial power dynamics that already existed, of course, between mining companies, states, and, and communities, um, but really, really dramatically intensified, has really dramatically intensified those patterns. And I think, um, uh, Riley Yesno, who's an analyst with the indigenous think tank, uh, the Yellowhead Institute, um, uh, has framed it as, as a weaponization of the health crisis. And, and I think that that framing really describes a lot of, of what, uh, has, what, what we can see across this, the continent. And to, to maybe name just a few ways that that has played out, there's been a, a seizing upon of this pandemic moment by different mining companies to circumvent uh, mandatory uh, consultation processes and violate the rights of indigenous communities. Um, in some cases, that looks like pushing ahead with controversial environmental impact assessment uh, processes, even though communities have made it clear that they don't have capacity to participate in them because they're dealing with the devastating impacts of the pandemic um, and, and other, inter other intersecting crises with the pandemic. Um, that's looked like governments rolling back environmental protections um, and, and continuing to provide direct financing to companies in this context. Um, and that has looked like, uh, and, and that has like, has raised really serious consequences um, for communities across the region. And, but then also to highlight, uh, again, another commonality, I think that, that resistance has continued um, in, in really important ways. So I'll, I'll stop myself there to stay within the two minutes. But I think the, the, the racism and settler colonialism of, of the moment um, is, is the important thing to highlight here. Thanks very much, Aiden. I think that is very clear to us, um, ladies and gentlemen. I think now um, let's move on with this conversation, with this dialogue. And um, uh, without asking any particular person on the panel, uh, perhaps uh, any of you can answer my second question, which comes in um, in form of uh, what are those specific dynamics uh, that are specific to a region, or perhaps maybe uh, taking a, a country a focus. Let's say if you're in Africa, which country uh, do you want to share with us that specific uh, dynamic issue that emerges uh, from your report? Any one of you can uh, uh, answer this question. Any, I'm happy any to feedback? go first if that works. Yes, Please go um, ahead. So something that is quite specific to Europe is this new European Green Deal that has been agreed and now is going to be try to be implemented. Um, and as a result of this deal, a lot of the European governments and companies are framing themselves as leaders in this green transition. Um, but a lot of the language they are using is as a lifeline to get out of the crisis from COVID or the environmental crisis. Um, but what is not being told is the whole story and this is often quite not the case and within this deal a lot of the policies are including an increase in mining 
which as we know is not beneficial to the climate crisis um, and within the deal there's a lot of copper and lithium mining projects being increased um, and these materials are being identified as essential um, and something else we have seen is a lot of the gold mining projects are now being included within this deal and being framed as a green material but uh, for one example of one case study in Ireland, um, only 12% actually goes, 12% uh, of gold only goes to industry demand and the rest goes to things like jewellery or bank vaults. So as we can see there, it is not actually used mainly for the so-called green transition. Um, and a lot, we see a lot of the companies using these discourses um, when in fact it's not the case, for example, the, the company operating in Ireland put out an advertisement uh, to say that that is where the gold was being used was for these green technologies, where as then it was proved that this company couldn't actually prove that they were going to the green technologies. Um, so luckily the ad got taken down, but by this point a lot of people had seen it and it just shows that these companies are framing their mining activities in this way so it's that's definitely something that we see a lot in Europe and as across all of the case studies in Europe as well. Thanks very much uh, thanks very much Meg for that uh, wonderful um, observation emerging from Europe and indeed this is not actually uh, in Europe right now the issue of the um, green revolution it's it's catching up everywhere and here in uganda actually the newspapers we read they were talking about uh, you know this campaign uh, around the issues to do with the uh, fossil fuels transitioning into uh, the green uh, economy so moving on lenny um if i could uh, hear from you uh, what uh, uh, are those specific dynamics emerging from your case study Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, well, complementing what Nick mentioned, it's interesting how in Europe uh, this Green Deal were established. And yeah, there are many examples that show how happened that. So what does it mean for Latin America? And in our case, yeah, um, the, the, for us, based on the report, um we need to rethink global energy transition proposals um that generate environmental justice and do not continue to reproduce the colonial relation relations that communities have uh, have been suffering for more than 500 years so for us there's not big difference it's the same model and and that's why it's is uh what is being reproduced with this alternative or green or transition energy uh, is, is the same development model that led us to the crisis we are experiencing now. And, and so it will continue to reproduce and worsen if, if extractivism uh, continues to deepen, of course, under the capitalist model and now with greater intensity, intensity as, as a, as a post-COVID economic recovery. So also if the countries of the global north do not take uh, uh, responsibility for the impact of this extractive capitalism economic model, and that now want to show us that there are alternative green alternatives, but, but in the practice, we are seeing that there's not differences. Um, so another aspect that it's particular for Latin America, um, because it's based on nine countries and around 15 cases. Um, so for us, uh, um, has to do with the process and how we uh, integrate into this global process. And, and for us was important, we were reflecting on how this project was conceived. And we thought we thought it was important not to reproduce other forms of domination, such as uh, intellectual extractivism, which is something that really happens when when people usually from the north mm, global north write uh, about the others, Africa, Latin America, Asia, 
And the idea is um, um, that's why we we went we made the effort within what was feasible to create conditions so that based organizations on the territories yes. could also write. It was not easy, and but at least to consider them as main actors in the way how we communicate what's happening in the territories during the pandemic frame in this issue of this project, which has to do with, with mining projects and, uh, and, and see what are the main demands and priori priorities that I are facing and in many cases um, risking their lives. Um, so that's why it's important at the end, maybe we will make more uh, other reflections. It's important to see the use, usefulness and how, how in what ways this report can, uh, can put in their struggles, strengthen them. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, very much. Um, thanks very much, Lenny, for uh, highlighting those key issues. And indeed, um, you know, I like where you're talking about the intellectual extractivism, where others want to define and, and see and throw it down your throat on how you should see from their side, but not looking at um, how you, you see it as an indigenous uh, a community or a people who are uh, impacted by this uh, extractivist model uh, of uh, um, uh, mining. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to transition now. Good, you've given us quite uh, interesting scenarios of what transpired uh, during the pandemic, uh, but uh, you, some of you, you highlighted about the struggles by frontline communities uh, and, and even some people are asking on the chat about the indigenous communities. What are those coping mechanisms that they applied uh, to see that um, they bravely resist and, and, and also model a pandemic recovery best in care for one another and for the planet? So you've highlighted that these really played out. People are resisting, communities are resisting, but uh, really, do you think that they have uh, hope of winning in this kind of struggles they are having? Uh, would like to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, I don't know whether uh, Hibis, you would like to take a shot at that. What makes you feel that uh, the frontline communities, the, the humanist defenders on the ground, uh, that there is hope in, in what they are doing, in the solidarity that they are putting together, that they will win in this battle? I think, um, thank you for that question. You know, your earlier question about the dynamics got me thinking uh, about the, at the core, what's at the core of what uh, people are facing and their responses to it, uh, what shapes their lives. And in many ways, the everyday ways that people build resilience and the everyday ways that people basically engage in the social reproduction of life in that sense, very much at the core of that, because you see the mining companies or the, the ways in which our formal economy has grown in the African context, you see that it's, it's, uh, it's been shrinking. Uh, the deindustrialization process has affected us much more deeply, uh, but also the mining companies in themselves, they, have, they create very few formal uh, se sector work. And therefore you have a lot of people who are essentially employed as day laborers, or uh, engaged in artisanal small-scale mining in various ways. Women are involved in that. And then you have agriculture. So um, agriculture in itself is coming, uh, that ability for people to sustain their lives on the basis of agriculture has come under so much attack. Smallholder producers, even though, even though we are essentially reliant on them, majority of the food that is produced in the world production, as we all know, famously 70%. Um, but then uh, you have a situation where as a result of the extractive strategies and the expansion that we saw, that's the thing, the mining companies were in some cases expanding production while they were laying off workers. So it was a disastrous situation for communities who, uh, even if you're a trader, a petty trader, you rely on someone earning an income to be able to trade, to, 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 to exchange goods uh, for, 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 for cash that you use to sustain uh, the, the livelihoods within your households. So the disastrous impact of that. And in the midst of all of this onslaught, the logical response people have had is to rebuild that ability for them, even if it meant going back to the same artisanal mining, which is interesting. In a specific case, we saw that women 
we're essentially looking uh, in Uganda, we're essentially looking to be able to uh, 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 be able to occupy pits that had been abandoned. So they were now occupying the space that had others had uh, discarded because it was no longer profitable for them to engage in that production. Um, so there are previous exclusion in different ways created new opportunities. And then of course the cooperatives, the forming of the cooperatives are very important for people to create, uh, to be able to grow staple meals and be able to produce that within their communities. Uh, the young people coming together across villages to think about ways in which they, but then the people also using legal mechanisms. You must know that it's not just building livelihoods. They were also responding and holding mining companies to account through uh, taking court cases, um, writing letters of protest, all of this is important. But for me, the key thing is thinking about the social reproduction of life and the ways in which people are trying to reclaim and rebuild that. Also, the ways in which they're, 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 they're able to build mechanisms where they are able to monitor the mining companies, even if the COVID curfews disrupted that. The case in Mali, for me, is important because people have that mechanism and have that ability and are able to constrain and limit that. That's serious power. I think that that's the kind of thing that can be taken as an example to encourage other communities and a, a way for us to also think about how they're able to do that. Because we know how extremely risky that is, the kind of threats that you can find yourself under. And um, it's really important to consider that in the midst of COVID, and this, this was not, uh, it didn't come out of the case studies, but later observations, uh, the, the extent to which you also have uh, conflicts and instability also growing. It's the COVID crisis also shaped that and it linked with that as well as Moscow mining in the Sahel region, which for me is, is, is also uh, concerning. Um, thinking about the ways in which uh, terrorist groups who are actually using the artisanal miners as a way to be able to access resources because the combination of the COVID crisis and drought had basically constrained their regular sources of uh, income. And so um, we had a situation that is extremely unstable, but in spite of that, in, in, in the Sahel region, you still have groups of people coming together to think of ways that they can respond and rebuild their abilities to be able to control their livelihoods. And I think that's really important to think about in relation to the ways in which we can also begin to think of ways that the economy can work differently. So instead of it being extractivist, especially in the Namibia case where they're talking about an indigenous economy, knowledge economy. So they are thinking about ways also, and there are actual interventions for training that has been put together to kind of actualize, materialize their ability to be able to set up uh, actual uh, uh, activities, economic activities. But we must understand that the economic activities are, for them are not just material things, it's also cultural. It's also a way of reclaiming themselves and the kind of violation that they've experienced as a result of the dispossession and the, 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 the environmental destruction that they've borne witness to and the loss of their ancestral lands. So uh, for, for, for me, I think that's, uh, that's probably a, a direction to think through the responses. Perfect, perfect. Uh, thanks very much, Hibist, for that and uh, for your ex experience sharing. I, I like I like the change, uh, and I think um, this answers to um, to some of the questions that uh, were coming online. For example, in Kechi or Dinukwe, you are looking at uh, you know the resistance strategies against mining in Africa and Latin America during the pandemic, and I think Hibis gives us some of these case studies where even women had to change the tactics and uh, and continue surviving and resisting uh, some of the things that uh, were happening. Let's cross over to um, uh, my colleague, uh, JB uh, from Asian Pacific. What what gives you hope in, in from these reports really and the, the various case studies you highlight and the resistance that is happening on the ground? What gives you hope? Thank you, Andrew. Well, I think that the biggest source of hope for many of the campaigners in the past two years is really the communities themselves who have been so creative and innovative in their responses. You know, three things come to my mind when, when, when I reviewed the Asia Pacific Road. This creativeness is exemplified in three instances. You know, in Indonesia, because of the lockdown, food was the main issue. The, the normal sources and procurement of food was so affected by the lockdown. So the communities who were resisting mining simply decided we will reclaim land, we will go back to our practices and plant our own food. 
And they were so successful, they convinced the, the young people that they can actually grow their own food. And they were so successful, they created a festival out of it in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and then in the Philippines, so that the barricades in the mine sites will not be dismantled by the police, now, so, some of our uh, resistors, resistors simply said, no, these are not barricades against the mines. These are medical checkpoints. We want to make sure that people who are traveling in and out of our towns are, are vaccinated, that they do not have symptoms. So, you know, these are not barricades against the mine, the miners. These are health checkpoints. And the local government was so happy because the local government was anti-mining and said, oh, we will provide you with, with, with alcohol and, 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 and you maintain those medical checkpoints so that the miners will not be able to come. I can ask you to slow down a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, Excitement is getting the better of me. Sorry, my interpreter friends. But one, one last uh, creativeness. You know, in Papua New Guinea, the Sepik tribe, the indigenous groups, simply got tired of the mining company not being truthful to them, or that the, the tribes simply got fed up with the government. The 28 tribal clans, you know what they did? They simply declared no-go zone for the whole river, and that's 1,000 kilometer of river banks. And they said, all the 28 tribal clans did a ritual and they all agreed no mining in this area because we are so fed up with this government and the mining company. And then this pandemic is making our lives so miserable. And definitely we do not want our lives to be more miserable with the entry of mining. So to simplify things, they just declared no mining in the whole river, 1,000 kilometers. And I think that you know, the creativeness of the communities against this de destructive and extractive project can simply be explained. The communities have this special connection with the land, with the water, with the forest. And they seem, you know, let's just be serious and stop the destruction of our resources and let us be creative with it. And that is where we get our source of hope. Thanks. Thanks very much, JB and um, uh, fellow panelists who have uh, uh, really ably uh, shown us where they get uh, this sense of hope in what uh, is happening on the ground. But now moving on, yes, you've highlighted the sense of hope that is with the communities, the, the resistance that is happening in the different territories, different regions. But now I would like to turn to you. You have led this process in your different um, uh, uh, areas. What, where do you get this motivation? Uh, to be part of this global coalition that is emerging, uh, which we are talking about now launching this global report. And as you know, we are not all that very old, but where do you get this uh, inspiration um, to be part of this uh, global coalition doing all this wonderful work? If I could turn to you, Lenny, I don't know, where do you draw your inspiration? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, where, and for me, um, one aspect that should motivate us to be part of a global coalition was um, to, to, but first to strengthen territor territorial defense struggles, which is, would imply many challenges seen from the global scenario. So that's why it is important to start. Um, that for, that's why for us and, and for me, it was important to start with the demands of the communities that are suffering the consequences of this capitalist destructive model in their territories. And for me, 
based on that one way to show solidarity is to strengthen those struggles of the communities and hoping that from global spaces um, uh, uh, we could generate pressure on the corporations so that they assume their responsibility for the social, economic, and environmental justices that, that they generate in the territories affected by these destructive activities, which is not which, which does not happened just during the pandemic, but it's historic in, in other regions. So we always are the ones who are being exploded and the resources, the people. So the idea is not just to denounce um, and uh, at least I, I have this um, hope that all the allies in the North that could do something could make pressure on this. This is one way, of course, my colleagues in this in Latin American committee can complement when we will have more time. But for example, most of the corporations in Latin America are from Suiza and Canada mainly. And yeah, uh, it's important that uh, the audience in, in those countries will know what those and corporations are, are doing in the territories and, and what are the impacts and, and see ways how, how they can create an international mechanisms that could force them because they will not change um, voluntarily. And so that they can uh, assume their responsibilities on what they are doing in the territories in the global south. I would say that, thanks. Thanks very much uh, for those reflections. Uh, perhaps uh, if I, I could uh, switch on to Meg, um, uh, from your experience, uh, what drives you to be part of this global uh, campaign or global coalition trying to do all this wonderful work? but also tie it in with the, if you have any reflections to share um, about how to do this kind of global work. People would be interested to learn how all this is shaping up and how can we effectively uh, you know, work together as a team to ensure that uh, we shake uh, this um, uh, extractivism crisis that we are having. Thank you for your question. Um, I think it's really important to work as a global coalition because although regionally there are a lot of things going on i think you can't ignore the relationships between other regions but like we spoke of earlier briefly the dynamics between global north and global south i think those dynamics are really important to recognize when talking about mining um because we have obviously inequalities between regions um, as well as within regions. So I think only you can realize this by working together as a global coalition to understand what's going on everywhere. Um, and I think it's really important to provide space for communities to connect across the globe as well, because uh, from someone I spoke to actually in one of my case studies, they um said to me how important it was for them to know what was happening in other regions to know that they're not alone and to know what other groups are doing to resist so i think there's that emphasis on solidarity and uh sharing between communities about what's what's going on so i think that's a way to sort of effectively work together because um, each community is, is not alone. This is happening across the globe. So I think it's important to get a global picture of what's going on and keep up the communication between everyone. So yeah, that's what I would say with that. Thank you. Perfect, uh, perfect. Thanks very much, Meg, uh, for your thoughts on this. Um, I, I, I keep following what is happening on the chat box and people asking, quite interesting questions. Before we dive into the second segment, maybe of our discussion, I'd like to remind uh, our participants that there will be a question and answer session 
So please take note of your questions and we'll be turning to that session uh, not long ago from now. But uh, uh, to continue this conversation, Aiden, I have not uh, skipped you for a wrong reason, but I would like to hear from your side. What do you have to say? What drives you? What drives your motivation uh, to be part of this global campaign? But also how can we effectively make sure that this coalition is up to speed in terms of the dynamics that happen or that are taking place uh, because the, the, the other actors are not sleeping. Definitely, yeah. I think I, I, I would echo a, a lot of what Lenny and Meg have already, have already said um, in their answers to, to this question. I think that the dynamics that they highlight um, and the motivations that they highlight, I think are, are really central to this, to this project. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll speak a little bit on that to kind of sketch out, like to sketch out some of the conversations we've been having about things that we want to continue, continue doing. Um, but there's been, uh, in, in this process so far, we've been talking about the need to, to document, um, some of these different things that are happening, but also like that, that, that is, is, is a beginning, uh, and that there's still things that can be done in, in using these materials and adapting them in ways that make them, uh, and, and really making sure that they're being shared um, in, in, effectively with, with, with the communities who've been part of the research process, because this research process has been so collaborative um, throughout. Um, and so thinking about future ways and future materials that we can be producing that, that make sure these, that, that, that these, these, this documentation uh, circulates widely, thinking about future ways that we can sort of coordinate our efforts and continue kind of building this power together, continue sharing information across world regions. Um, because the, the, the sorts of crises that are being documented in these reports are, are, are global in, in nature and, and play out very differently in, 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 and have a lot of very important regional specificities. Um, but I, I think that one of the, the main motivations for this project is, is thinking about ways that we can build power collectively um, and support that work, um, support the work that, that one another are doing in a way that 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 makes that makes all of that all of it stronger. Um, so yeah, I'll, I, I would say that those are those are some thoughts there. Thanks, thanks very much, Aiden, for those uh, wonderful. Um, indeed, there is need for us to keep together and fight and uh, and build um, because we have different skills, different. Um, uh, information which we need to put together so that we can continue with this uh, uh, important work. Now, um, I would like to turn to my co-host. Uh, I know uh, uh, we are moving on well, but uh, there are quite a number of uh, uh, questions, suggestions that are, have been coming in, and I would not want to uh, frustrate those ideas because I think people are talking from what so far has been shared, they are trying to tie the loose ends here and there. So please, um, yeah, let me call in my uh, co-host to come in and uh, be able to uh, put to the panelists some of the questions that uh, are emerging from our audience. Over to you. Thank you, Thank you Andrew. Um, so, Wit, Andy Whitmore has asked a question in the Q&A, which I, I think may have been addressed by some of the last round of discussion. The question is, what lessons have we learned and, then, and what, the, what will they mean for our organizing in the future? So I think, I think some of that has come out, but um, maybe we can ask uh, Wit if that, if that question has been answered to his satisfaction. True. So uh, our panelists, uh, I think you've listened and had uh, that question that emerges, what lessons do we learn? Uh, but of course, I think most of you tried to touch on it, but perhaps uh, I don't know who else feels uh, would like to have a go at that. I'll give, I'll give Wit, uh, I've opened his microphone. Wit, if you want to speak up. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I hope you can hear me. Um, yep. Yeah, no, I think I think there have been some good answers, and I really appreciate um, uh, particularly some of the the um, in the chat as well, some of the points. But I guess I'm just really interested to know 
particularly from the bits of research and the working together, you know, if there are any specific lessons as to how we can move forward, um, anything else that we can be doing in a way of supporting communities, and I guess kind of like uh, how we move the uh, to the next stage, really, um, in terms of uh, any further lessons that need to be uh, researched or shared. Uh, who among our group would like to answer that first? Lenny, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, you are loud and clear. Thanks. Um, thanks for your question, Andrew. And yeah, for me, one of the lessons is that um, something about uh, all of us were talking about, but I think it's it's good to make an emphasis that has to do with the, uh, what was really important. Um, what was one of the big lessons for me is that what is really what really sustain their lives um, um, during the pandemic uh, but considering all the historical antecedents in each region and other crises that were happening um, <clears throat> um, so one lesson is that what really could help people survive in this uh, period of time during the pandemic um, was not what mining companies and, and uh, states also offer in terms of development and job opportunities with these mining projects, right? They always are convincing people during the pandemic, they were convincing them then that uh, they are given some many, many good ideas about development, but now I think most of the communities could see and value more the importance of having a piece of land, a territory where you can produ produce your, your, your food, and not just in crisis during the pandemic, but in general, and that become more evident. So for me, the, the important thing is that what was really something that helped people was not what um, usually we hope and ask all the time in terms of rights and in many ways from the state, from the corporations, but what really helped people to survive was the take care uh, of another, um, the ones who had at, at least a piece of land, at least a, a, a water, not contaminated water, one was the ones who really could uh, respond in, in a better way to this crisis. So. For me, it's like, uh, that's why uh, it became more clear that something essential was not mining activities, mining projects. What really it's essential is uh, in, the, in the community's struggles is, is mutual care, is revolution of local knowledge and practices aimed uh, uh, of, of food for, any, for sovereignty, community health and care and care for local ecosystems. So I think if people uh, or the or international organizations want to help, we need to see ways how we can strengthen all these aspects because many people couldn't even go to the hospitals and all mm, local knowledge about how to, how to use so many plants and things like that become more important. And that was what people used at the end. And, and that's why many could survive. Of course, not, not all. And at the same time, many died. So I would say that just as a, as a, as a reflection. Thanks. OK, thanks. Thanks very much uh, for those uh, reflections, Lenny. And uh, I think um, uh, quite interesting uh, perspectives that are emerging. We have one of our colleagues um, uh, who has been following this uh, this debate, and the, and uh, and uh, uh, so I would like to uh, call in JB as um, as uh, we see how best to wrap up uh, this segment. JB, yeah, yeah. So I I have one 
uh, recommendation on moving forward, or at least then how how we can take this to the next level. You know, in Asia Pacific, we we had five countries that we produced case studies, and in all five countries, we saw that governments either introduced new laws or changed their laws for the benefit of the industry or excluded the mining industry in regulations. And that was during the time of the pandemic. And I think if this is also true for the other continents, Latin America, Africa, Europe, and North America, then that should be exposed. At some point, we should issue a statement or, or a declaration of the conspiracy. I cannot describe it anything else. Our governments conspired with the industry to make the, the industry more profitable under a global crisis of a pandemic. And so I think that's a very strong argument why there is no such thing as responsible mining. Because how can you actually practice or believe in responsible mining when in the middle of a global crisis such as COVID-19, the main agenda of the industry is how to convince our governments to make laws or change laws or exclude their industry from regulation so that they become more profitable. I think that's an interesting communication project that we should be using this research to move it Thanks forward. To Thanks to Jebby for that um, uh, input. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, let me invite in one uh, of our colleagues, Evans Rubara, who I think, if I'm not wrong, is uh, based in uh, either Russia or Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And uh, Evans, if you can uh, unmute and uh, within two minutes, you give us your thoughts. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I believe that you will hear a bit of uh, noise from my side. Um, in a public uh, transport, but thank yeah, you. Please, uh, can you increase on the volume? Evans? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Uh, still, you are far from your microphone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You are far from your microphone. Oh please get closer to the microphone, otherwise uh, you are faint, you are sound is low. All right, can you hear me now? We can hear you, but uh, faintly. Okay, okay. then uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just leave it here so that I don't take much time. Uh, Please, go ahead. We'll talk later. Okay, so I was just saying that uh, first and foremost, thank you for convening this meeting. And um, in, in doing so, Hello, can you hear me now? Oh. You are now loud and clear. All right. So what, what I wanted to say uh, that um, thank you for convening this meeting because and the, the research really, it's very important for us to know what's going on in the extractive industry uh, landscape. Now, uh, the, the, the research that has been carried out has actually uh, highlighted a lot of things. And one of the things that I would like to say is that we need to look at the mining industry as a value chain. And I, I was involved uh, in uh, one of the research aspects, especially that which looked into Tanzania. I was part of the team that worked on that. And I think that we really need now, uh, with all these results that we have come up with, we need to come up with um, a more focused approach to what we are doing either to decide whether we are going to deal with the sector as it is, uh, just look at mining and the human rights violations, or look at it from uh, holistically uh, as a value chain. I think that that's what I would say because I believe that there's a lot of noise on my side. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Evans. Uh, you are loud and clear at the end and we highly appreciate uh, uh, the, the, the views that you are sharing. Uh, and I think uh, in Tanzania, it's quite um, uh, uh, known that mining is really uh, 
on a higher side and it's shaping uh, the developments there and of course impacting on agricultural lands and other human rights uh, violations that are taking place. Ladies and gentlemen, I realize that time is not uh, our best ally, but I realize, uh, I don't know from my co-host, Jamie, if there is one specific issue that we need to pick from uh, the box. Otherwise, uh, um, uh, Severin uh, Haingura, Tem, yeah, she's, he or she is asking about uh, how do we deal with mining activities invading agricultural spaces uh, and this is where the community have little uh, space left for the agricultural uh, activities to support their livelihood uh, activities. And perhaps uh, another issue, uh, panelists, if, if you can uh, wrap it up, someone is asking, is there any case study in terms, especially from the African uh, continent, Hibist, where communities took up uh, public interest litigation, or they took up a legal course of action, and there was a success in that line. Uh, is, is there any case study to quote? And then lastly, panelists, people are asking here, what does all this mean in terms of gender? We've not talked much about the impact. Uh, this whole discussion and the, the, the tactics that were used by mining companies and our governments, what are those gendered impacts that we monitored and documented in our different reports? Yeah, so I, I'd like to uh, respond, uh, Andrew. There's a lot of things you put on the table, but uh, immediately on the gender question, uh, the Africa reports did, um, I think in our case studies, what we did was that we looked at the, um, uh, the empirical evidence and sought to uh, think through the gender implications. Um, so I think this is uh, something to, to work on more uh, determinedly together um, in, the, in the future. Uh, because any kind of work on gender analysis requires um, the data gathering. The whole process needs to be thought through from scratch. But I think we, we, we it would be good to get responses on the, the, the analysis in the report. But to get to it, it's, it's really very clear that the burden of social reproduction fell largely on women. And we were talking about uh, also knowledge. We are talking about uh, knowledge of herbs and we are talking about the ways in which we respond uh, to traditional knowledge. Women usually are the ones who are the custodians of that. Um, in, other, in another lens also, if we're thinking about the impact that the, 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 the crisis was having, um, if we're looking at the question of farmers, smallholder farmers, the image we should be having in our minds is that of uh, a woman, particularly uh, in some of the case studies that we looked at specifically, 60% uh, of the women would be the ones who are, are doing agricultural work and rely primarily on agricultural work. And so you have a situation where the, the dispossession, the environmental impacts, the drought, these are all things that the women have to cope with to figure out how to sustain their households. And remember that there's also a migration dimension which needs to be looked at more carefully. Uh, I think with the migration dimension, you'd find that women relate with that a bit differently. The they, 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 they men tend to be on the move while women also migrate and the migration patterns also uh, feeding into low wage, earn, uh, low wage work, particularly when it came to artisanal small scale mining. Um, so you have the, the, the women essentially at the front lines of, 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 of the COVID crisis. And also in terms of the health, dealing with the health crisis in itself on one level uh, and dealing with caring for the ill. And at the same time, also dealing with the impacts of this uh, aggressive forms of uh, mining. Uh, so for instance, in Okavango, if we're thinking about the impact that the seismic testing was having on water, which was a key concern that uh, the public had, but also the communities. It's women who have to deal with where can we get water that's not going to make us sick? Or when people do get sick, how do you now have to care for more people and themselves as they also fall ill? And usually women are the last to be cared for since they are essentially the caregivers. Um, so it's it, it essentially placed them at the center of the crisis. And I think this is something that uh, probably we can think through uh, systematically to, to draw our analysis together in a way to, to, to show the evidence um, that, uh, that, uh, that because 
if we're going to do an analysis of the, the, the impacts of the crisis, but also the responses women in particular are having to the crisis. And like I said earlier, it's centered on livelihoods. So the women's responses were, how do we keep our, our, our communities going? How do we produce food? Uh, how do we uh, engage uh, in activities that uh, keep uh, our households functioning normally? Um, and keep the well-being of the family protected or the households and the community protected as a whole. Now, when it came to litigation, Mali, the Wasaton Association, it brings together inhabitants of about 12 communities and they filed a complaint against the mining company in 2020. Um, I don't know what the outcome of that process was, whether it's still ongoing. So success is a very difficult uh, thing for, for, for me to be able to assess on the basis of the evidence that we gathered. Um, so uh, the, the people of uh, Flolu in uh, Ivory Coast, uh, they sent a letter of protest to a mining company to demand it stop demar uh, demarcating their land without, uh, without consent. Uh, so this was a, a, a this was ancestral lands that they were being dispossessed of, and the mining company was expanding while it had cut it cut down its workforce by about three hundred young people. Um, so I think that th that's the evidence that we have. So the evidence in itself is indicative and flags for us. But for me, I think a key concern is to think about how we can support the communities that we're working with in the front line or the, the, the constituencies that we're working with in the front line for them to be able to then take the actions that they need, uh, but knowing fully well also in the context of militarization and securitization, which I think is actually in the African continent is going to get much worse. Um, especially with the Ukraine crisis in itself, it has completely worsened the situation uh, currently and has is, is deepening the patterns and with the just, uh, with the so-called just transition uh, or the green extractivism, it's also creating a, a very dangerous uh, context within which uh, people have to navigate. But as Evans was saying earlier on the call, and I think it's important to keep this in mind, in Africa, we're also very much concerned about how we can control our own resources and use them for our own purposes. This is a very key thing to be really understand the African context because of how much we've been dispossessed, because of how much uh, we've been dehumanized, uh, the extent to which uh, so much wealth has been extracted and very little left for the well-being of our own people. And therefore, asserting our resource sovereignty is also important. And currently, the debates in the African region are about how do you get those value chains to also be uh, environmentally sustainable forms of extraction. And that's like a very difficult conversation to have, but we're having those conversations with various constituencies, including the artisanal miners, who are very important because these are local communities saying we want to use the resources for our own ends. Yes, they still export. So we have to think of ways to retain the value and so that we use the resources in a sensible way, in a way that we maintain uh, a balance with nature. Very difficult, but we're in the process of these conversations. And I do hope that the global uh, platforms also create space for these conversations to also be integrated in that vision. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hibist, for I gave you quite a lot of um, uh, you know, leverage uh, so that um, uh, you uh, you come in with those um, uh, concrete examples on how we documented the gender aspects in during this period and how it played out, especially uh, or for uh, uh, in the different territories, especially on the African continent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, time is not our best ally, but uh, I would like you, myself to. Uh, really end it here and uh, in a minute or so I'll be handing over to my co-host but I think through this um, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic experience uh, we learn that uh, it has really ex accelerated existing economic and political power asymmetries which are at, one, at once racist, sexist, colonial and imperialist in nature. So we learn from this sharing that mining companies and states around the world have worked hand in hand to ensure resource extraction continues or even accelerates uh, or wait. Uh, I mean, it really goes on without uh, uh, anyone questioning. And uh, uh, we realize that despite the risks, communities have continued to resist uh, what um, multinational corporations and governments are doing, and that courage has gone on. 
I can uh, able to share with you that uh, even right now I'm seated in Karamoja sub-region here in northern Uganda and uh, the human rights defenders are being uprooted from their communities but meeting them and talking to them they are still saying uh, come rain come sunshine we shall continue with our work on the ground uh, to protect uh, the rights uh, of the ind indigenous communities who are being dispossessed of their land in the uh, context of mining. So leaders have actively modeled uh, what is just recovery uh, could like, highlighting the importance of preventing mining related environmental damage, practicing mutual care and defending local knowledges and practices best in food sovereignty, community health and caring uh, for local ecosystems. So we realize that this uh, campaign is very, very important and there are going to be upcoming events uh, from this uh, global launch uh, of this global report, but we are going to come up, um, of course, with the, now the launch events are going to uh, the regions and make sure that uh, these reports, are, you know, the information goes up to the last, last person, uh, but also we have some big upcoming moments to plan for, uh, for example, we want to have a mining company AGM season such that we are able to equally be visible during that um, uh, event. But also these materials are going onto our website and uh, this website is also being launched today. And it's on that note that I call upon uh, my colleague uh, to, uh, uh, to come in and uh, highlight uh, give us guidance on uh, how this website is going to work and what we need to look up for on this website such that at the end of the day we are able to utilize all the materials to guide us in our uh, campaign in the different spaces that we occupy so i would like to request aiden to come in and uh, guide us uh, on this um, uh, website that we are also launching up out today aiden over to you Perfect. Thank you so much, Andrew. I'll be really quick with this, um, and I'll just quickly share my screen here. Um, but so the website, the I posted the link in the chat, um, and I'll show everyone the website here. Um, so the thinking that has come out kind of over the course of this process is that it, it's useful to have a kind of a centralized platform where we can be sharing new materials as they're released. And, and to have this going forward be a, a, a sort of a place where as, as the neither the mining nor the COVID-19 pandemics are going anywhere, to have this as a place uh, where we can continue to share resources about these ongoing struggles. Um, to just sort of quickly scroll through, you'll see that um, the, uh, the regional reports um, and case studies are, are can be found here. Um, and then as kind of going forward, um, uh, there's also space to contact uh, the coalition. We also have an email address set up. So it, for any further discussion, we'd really appreciate um, hearing from folks um, and, and continuing these conversations. Um, yeah, briefly, briefly, this is this is the site, um, and we hope that it can be a useful resource to these continuing uh, continuing movements and struggles in in the months and, and years to come. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll throw it back to you. Thanks very much, Aiden. I think everyone now can utilize that resource uh, such that we continue with our struggles. And I like what Ravi is sharing with me here. And he's saying that communities must and should continue fighting because not fighting is worse than fighting. I think on that note, colleagues, I would like to hand over uh, to my co-host, uh, Jimmy and uh, request him to uh, really see us off and uh, uh, give us all the concluding remarks that he has for us today. Over to you, Jimmy. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for that wonderful summary. Thank you for looking after this whole event. Uh, I would like to recognize the, the coalition members just to mention the organizations behind this, which uh, my own organization, Mining Watch Canada, but also WOMIN in South Africa, Terra Justa in Bolivia, the London Mining Network, obviously in the UK, uh, Alianza Tigalmina in the Philippines, War on Want, also based in the UK, the Institute for Policy Studies from the United States of America, 
uh, Rathet and Vergenwald, also known as Salva La Salva in Germany. Yes to Life, No to Mining, which is a global network and the, also the UK-based Gaia Foundation. So with that, I would like to thank you all for attending. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest and attention. And thank you for taking this message and this learning and taking it out into the world in your own work, in your own conversations, your own organizing. And we invite you to stay in touch. Uh, stay in touch with us at the, the uh, COVID mining at miningwatch.ca email address. Uh, keep check periodically on, on that website to see what else is new and, um, and follow at Pandemic Mining on Twitter. Thank you all again. Thank you very much to the panelists and, and to Andrew again for, uh, I think, a, a really rewarding discussion of what has been an immense amount of work. And I think when, when people have a chance to look through those reports, they will find a, a real wealth of, of experience and knowledge and wisdom expressed there. And, and I think a lot of motivation as well and a lot of hope for the future. So with that, thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day.